Welcome to the section on modeling. Generally, when you have a task, you try to gather some data and then you have to select an appropriate model on which you are going to train your data so that you could have good results. And depending on your task, you could have models like linear regression, logistic regression, support vector machines, neural networks, just to name a few. In this subsection, we shall talk about modeling using linear and logistic regression. And before continuing, we shall explore the data we will be working with. This data is gotten from college.sengage.com. So here we have a list of data sets for linear regression. And if we select this help data set, we have this. We have x1, that's we have five different variables, x1, x2, x3, x4, x5. x1 is the death rate per 1,000 residents. x2, the doctor availability per 100,000 residents. x3, the hospital availability per 100,000 residents. This is the annual per capita income in thousands of dollars. x5, the population density per square mile. Now, we have this reference, Live in America, Small Cities, by G.S. Thomas. So we downloaded this here, and we have our CSV file from this. So we shall look at the CSV file shortly. But before looking at that, we shall see that uh, we're going to be like trying to predict from X2, X3, X4, and X5 the value of X1. So in this case, we're going to have X2, X3, X4, X5 as our inputs, while X1 is our output. So we we're trying to use these variables to predict the death rate per 1,000 residents. That said, our CSV file looks like this. We have x1 this way, x2, x3, x4, x5. Generally, we used to have an x1 at this uh, rightmost corner. But in this case, we consider now x1 to be this here. Now, in the subsection, we shall just take a few of these data points and work with so rearranging this, we have x2 and then our y, which is x1. And all these data points have been gotten from the CSV file we just saw. So let's kind of uh, do a plot of these points. Now, for demonstration purposes, we didn't take the exact points we have here. So we'll just continue with this plot. So we have this point 1, point 2, point 3, point 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. And we have these points and this. Now, what we have to understand about modeling is that what we're trying to do is to have this kind of function, or in this case, this kind of linear function, which is going to mimic the way our data set works. So if we're given a new data, like a new x2, a new value for x2, which is not found in this data set, this linear equation or this function should be able to give us a value for x1 which is kind of representative of this data set and that's exactly what we're trying to do here we're trying to find this best model for our data set now it should be noted that this is a line so we have a line which generally takes the form y equals mx plus c in this case y is x1 x is x2 so this is y equals mx plus c in this case c is equals zero so we have this x1 equals m1 x2 we're gonna see why we use x m1 here because we are gonna work with three different lines so this is like the gradient of line one and then the next line m2 and that the next m3 so the whole point here is we're trying to minimize these different because between this function and each of the data points so we have this we could have this difference for this other data point this difference this this difference this so we find that actually with this point for example there is no difference so this function is kind of actually performing excellently with this particular point but then with this other point it performs very poorly now let's look at this other line or this other proposed line or model so we have this x1 equals m2 x2 in this case instead of m1 we have m2 because it has a different gradient now we find that we could look at the differences. We have this difference. We look at this. 
So the, we see that this uh, this other line is kind of uh, a, a another proposal to the function which is trying to mimic this data set. So it's kind of we have uh, an infinite number of lines or an infinite number of possibilities because we could have a line which is say in this other direction. So we have a line with this negative gradient considering that this is positive x axis and positive y axis. So we could have a line going this way and as another possibility so we have an infinite number of possibilities but now the that based on the data set we're kind of trying to select the best parameters so that this line mimics the data set as much as possible and that's why when it comes to machine learning or deep learning we always talk about weights because basically these weights are in this case for example this m1 and this m2 so for this we're saying that our weight is actually m1 and in this case our weight is m2 so whenever you get weight it shouldn't sound or get a word weight set somewhere it shouldn't sound maybe complicated because basically it's kind of just a, a simple parameter which we are trying to modify and actually get the best possible for our data set so that's it now you would notice that uh, if we have a point here say if we have a value for x2 at this point this other function will tell us that its value is here so if for this other function say this second line it's going to tell us that the value of x1 is this and then this other line tells us that like from there we extrapolate here it tells us that the value is this so it's very important to choose the best possible or the most appropriate of these lines because we see that just with the same value input as of x2 we have two different values of x1 or the output which actually have a very non-negligible difference so we have to be very careful while selecting our parameters now it's important to note that when c is zero we are only we are somehow restrained with the kind of linear functions we'll be working with now what if we can take a c different from zero so we can take a c like this or the one which produces this line we find that we could have something different and it's going to take the form x1 equals m3 x2 m3 is to say that this is the gradient of line 3 so it's m3 x2 plus c3 and the c3 is what we generally call the bias so generally we shall have weights and biases now notice how for this linear model to get the output we have this input x2 times the weight m3 plus a 1 times c3 so actually this is a bias and it isn't multiplied by uh, one of the inputs so in this case we have this and generally we write it as or uh, most of the times you will find in literature written as uh, theta 0 plus theta 1 x so this theta 0 is the bias and theta 1 is the weight times x which is the input now a little correction this should have been y equals this so we have y equals this which is kind of equivalent to what we've written here now let us get back to our final mac and quiz example we saw previously so here we have our final mac and then we have the quiz so we've got some data points and we have this then we have our y regress which is theta 0 plus theta 2 x2 now the reason we we haven't worked with uh, many other inputs or situations where we have many more inputs is simply because here we're trying to represent this on this plane or on this screen and maybe representing four dimensions five dimensions is kind of very difficult so that's why we we work with this nonetheless if we have many more of this inputs say x2 x3 x4 x5 is going to be similar to what we've seen already so we have y regress that is actually the output is equals theta 0 which is the bias we saw exactly why the bias is very useful plus theta 2 x2 plus theta 3 x3 plus theta 4 x4 plus theta 5 x5 and it should give us something equal now to our x1 now coming back to this we have say suppose we have this line as our linear function which mimics our data set and it has a particular gradient and a certain y intercept which represents the bias while the grid gradient represents the weight so we have this and now 
um, suppose we want to work with um, a different kind of function, not only this um, straight line. Say we want to work with a quadratic function. What we could do is um, we have theta zero. That's in the case of this x two, for example, we could create another column which is going to be made of x two squared. So instead of working only with x two, we could have x two and then x two squared. So we're going to have y predicted or y regress because we're working on a regression model equals theta zero plus theta one times x two plus theta two times x2 squared. So notice that this theta 1 and theta 2 are actually different. So in this case, we have two weights, or two weight values, and one bias, unlike this. So we still have the same one input that's actually x2, but we've like squared it and created another column. And then we've had this. And this could lead us to something like this. So we could have, instead of this straight line, we could have this quadratic curve. So Depending on the kind of data you have, it's important to know whether you should be creating a new column like this or not. So in some cases, like in this case, normally we should be working with a straight line because this actually isn't uh, clearly having a quadratic or needing a quadratic curve to have um, the best fit. And also, generally when doing this kind of manipulations, you tend to overfit the data and we should see overfit at the level of corrective measures so it's very important to know or to take a balance so sometimes you may even go up to taking this squared plus theta 2x2 cubed and so on and so forth but there should always be a balance because if you want to get all the points or if you want to get a curve a very complicated curve which passes through all these points then at the end of the day when given new data is going to find it difficult actually getting the right value for that new data or getting a, a good value for that real for that new data so it's important to have always a balance or to know when to add this kind of columns where we have a column being uh, a square or a cube of an existing column let's take a look at a classification problem where Students with a MAC above a certain threshold were considered to have passed and students with a MAC below that threshold considered to have failed. So yeah, we'll, be, we'll need to work with a different kind of function and not just a linear function as we've seen above. So if we look at this, we should have a function that should be very similar to this. So here we have this function which takes all values below, let's say we have this threshold at this point, so we have threshold at this point all values below this threshold are sent to zeros and all values above the threshold are sent to a one so here we consider this to be one and then here a zero a very popular nonlinear function which has this kind of characteristics is the sigmoid function with the sigmoid function we have oh, say y equals sigmoid of x then y is equals to 1 divided by 1 plus e to the minus x. So all values which are turning towards negative infinity are, let's say we have negative infinity here, we have um, e to the negative, negative infinity, so it gives us e to the positive infinity. And the exponential of positive infinity is a very, very big number. Now, if this is a bit confusing, let's take an, a simpler example. Say we have a negative 10. So we have e to the negative, negative 10. So we're going to have e to the 10. Now, 1 divided by e to the 10 is a very small number. So we tend to have numbers that are going towards 0. So this at this point, we have this x-axis, which is the asymptote. So this our curve of this function is going uh, approaching 0 as we go, as x tends towards negative infinity. You could look at our cause on calculus to better understand these concepts. Now, um, say so x is turning towards positive infinity. Let's take an example, say x equals five. We have e to the negative five. Now, e to the negative five is a very small number. So one divided by one plus a very small number, let's say, let's then say this tends to zero. We have one divided by one plus zero. So it's very, very close to one divided by one, which is actually one. So as we go towards positive infinity would turn into us one. So that's how this sigmoid function works. 
So we have this simple examples here. That said, instead of having just um, the output be uh, a line say mx plus c, in this case we have our y predicted, which is gonna be a sigma of mx plus c. So we have this theta zero plus theta one x. And now to come back to our initial notations, we have y logis, that's y logistic, that's the output of this logistic regression model is equals the sigma. The sigma represents the sigmoid function. So we have the sigmoid of theta zero plus theta two x two plus theta three x three plus theta four x four plus theta five x five. Instead of just this linear function, we now have this nonlinear function, which is going to be sending all values which are very uh, which are tending towards negative infinity to zero and all values tending towards positive infinity to one. If we now have two inputs, that is, instead of just having a quiz and an output final Mac, we have the quiz, the number of R's, and then the output is going to be seen from the coloring of the points. So in this case, this white points represents students who passed and this other orange points represents students who failed. So in this case, we'll need a non-linear function like this to actually separate these two regions. It's important to note that we, for this graph, that's for this three graph, this, this, and this, we use the data set from the task, that is the data set we presented earlier in the task, and then for this demonstrations, that is, in these equations, we use this data set which we got from the sengage.com site and which we displayed on the CSV file. That said, we've had some, or we've worked with two models, and in this next section, we shall be discussing error measurement.